So this is a new experiment with us having a screen uh, on the platform. Um, you know, we, we enjoy having our projector as well. Are you guys able to get it okay over there? I don't want to leave out. You guys back there need this sermon today. We got we to gotta get this. I've been thinking about this group right over here. So... But um, this does belong to the church. It was donated to us by a church member. Uh, we're very thankful for, uh, for that. Um, so uh, we may use it more than just during our, our origin series. So uh, Dr. Hudson, you've uh, uh, given us that to look forward to as part of that uh, experience as well. Um, is this on? Are you hearing me? I have a firm belief that every time you come to church, you're here for a reason. Whether you're a longtime member, one of our regular visitors, or maybe you're a first-time guest, I just don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe uh, that it's just random chance when an opportunity comes to worship together and to study God's Word together and, and to hear from His Scriptures. So I pray uh, that you would allow your heart to be open to what I'm going to share today because um, it's very important, I think, and dear to my heart, and I think we will be a a stronger community uh, as we hear God speak to us today. Let's, let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we worship you today. We're so thankful, Lord, that we have this comfortable place that we can gather, uh, that we have uh, great friendships here, and we have uh, uh, opportunities to, to spend time with each other and with you, Lord. As we now transition in our program to this part of the, of the service, Lord, we want to continue to worship you, and we want to continue to hear from you. Uh, we want your scriptures to be speaking. We want your Holy Spirit to be in our hearts. So, Lord, use this moment right now to transform us, to bless us, and to help us mature in our faith and grow into the individuals that you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, do you like my tie? Isn't a nice, this is my second favorite tie, second favorite. Uh, I knew I had this tie when, when we moved to Arizona, but shortly after we moved here, I lost the tie, and I was broken up about it. Thought I lost the tie forever. And then just about, well, about a month ago, it appeared. Want to know where it was? It was in my daughter's bedroom. Now, I had seen in, in you know, sitcoms and stuff where, where girls get to that age where they want to start wearing their dad's clothing. I just hadn't realized that that had reached that point yet because Timory had this for some reason. I don't know why, but it had gotten lost in a room. I'm very thankful that I got my second favorite tie back, Eva. So I just wanted to share that story because it'll be a better sermon today because I'm wearing my second favorite tie. Um, I want to get into... Uh, the Bible again this morning. I'm continuing on a series uh, that I've been presenting over the last couple weeks, and I still have a few more to go before we get to the end, but I want to get right into it this morning. It's on criticism. Now, notice this passage. We need to guard against a critical spirit, for it is much easier. You know, I like to point out these, these uh, adjectives and these demonstratives uh, when we're giving counsel like this. It is much easier to find fault with others than to reform ourselves. Would you agree with that? You know, sometimes I think maybe Gandhi read Ellen White because Gandhi is credited with the saying that we often think of, uh, you know, that you need to be the change that you see in others. Have you ever seen that quote before? That, that to my knowledge, that gets traced back to Gandhi. That's basically what, uh, what the spirit of prophecy is telling us here. It's much easier to find fault with others than to change ourselves. It's much easier, uh, you know, to say, well, they need to be more forgiving. They need to be more kind. You know, they need to be more generous. They need to be more honest. And when we reflect on that, well, sometimes if we were more forgiving, if we were more kind, if we were more generous, if we were more honest, then maybe we would begin to see that more in others is the kind of idea here. All right. I need a, I need a couple of helpers here for the kids quiz. Dean Mark, thank you so much. And Toby, you've been one of my regulars. Black and blue is the mics. Ellie, thank you. 
This sermon series is about what? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, I see Eric and I see Dylan. Let's go at Eric first. What are we talking about? Attitudes, base, Bible basics. What are we talking about? Attitudes. Attitudes. You've been paying attention. I like that. We're talking about attitudes here. These, these core ideas that define us. And we talked about what an attitude is. So we are studying bad attitudes in which Old Testament story? Are we looking at Noah's Ark, the wilderness wanderings, the life of David, or the story of Daniel? I saw A.B.'s hand go up. Sorry if I'm missing any over here. Uh, B, the wilderness wanderings. You are right. Thank you, A.B. We've been looking at bad attitudes amongst these holy people that God saves out of Egypt. You would think they'd be the most joyous, celebratory people in the world. They've been saved from slavery. God is with them. The Holy Spirit is guiding them. They should be just parading in, in triumph and joy, but that's not how the story goes. And the Bible says they are an example to us. I'm not even to the next question yet. You already know the answer? I'm kind of moving along here. So one of the attitudes we looked at was complaining. Instead of complaining and whining, we should be what? We should be what? I want to, you know, there are young people over here as well. Do we have anyone? All right, yeah. Is that Lindell? All the way in the back. We should be thankful. We should be thankful. I like how you had to grab the mic right from me. He said, yes, sir, Yay. thankful. You are right. Yay. We should be thankful. Yes. All right. Instead of being greedy and coveting, we should be what? We should be what? All right. Isaiah? Uh, a good friend. A good friend. Yes. That is wonderful. Now, I saw Carson's hand, too. Can we let Carson have a try? That's, an, uh, that's a great answer, Isaiah. Content? Content, yes, and a good friend is a content friend too, right? So that's what we talked about last week. Last question. The next bad attitude we're studying is what? It's found in Numbers 12, and it's criticizing, being judgmental, fault-finding, or condemning. What, which, what are we studying next? Eric, you've had a chance. A.B., I want to see if anyone else, did you, did you catch the title of the sermon? That's the question. All right, go in the back to either Owen or Sean or Jacob. Maybe they all want to say it together. A. <laughs> you know, it's all of them, really. It's all of them. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Toby. You can just set the mics down. That's appreciate the young people uh, participating. Now, we're going to be talking about these things, but thankfully I can report to you that this is only what the world does. Christians don't do these things. We're never caught up in these things. So we're just going to, no, <laughs> you know, I sometimes I'm being a little facetious, but I introduced, uh, uh, you know, we've been using the passage in first, in first Corinthians throughout this series as a reminder that the Bible invites us to review this specific story. The Bible in the New Testament says, look at the children of Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness, because that's you. That's what it says. It says, these stories are, uh, are an example to us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The struggles that they had are our struggles. It's not like we've evolved to where we're no longer dealing with these issues. So Paul continues to say, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. I gave you this kind of chart last week of how these attitudes progress. If it starts with complaining, is what they did, if we don't deal with complaining, it, you go backward and down, and then you become greedy, and then you begin to become critical, then doubt enters your heart, and suddenly you as the children of God are now rebelling against the very God that saved you. This is exactly what happened with the children of Israel. But if we can answer these bad attitudes, with what God wants us to have, a spirit of thankfulness and contentment and love, we ascend, we go forward, and we grow to become the people God wants us to be. So today, uh, we're going to be looking at criticism. Criticism. And I'm going to warn you, I'm going to preach today. Okay. Just because it's in the middle doesn't mean it's the worst thing, all right? Criticism is at the heart of the destructive work that Satan does 
within the community of God that wrecks everything that God wants to do on this planet. It is of vital importance for the people of God to recognize this vice and this bad attitude because of the power that it has. And remember, these are complementary. So the answer for complaining is thankfulness. The answer to greed is contentment. The answer to criticism is love. When we are critical, we are doing the opposite of love. And that is a a, a tragedy that I want us to analyze within the biblical narrative uh, as we get into it. Let me define criticism. You might wonder, what's the difference between complaining and criticism? When we talked about complaining, we defined it as expressing dissatisfaction with a situation or a circumstance that's not wrong and for which you are doing nothing to improve. Okay? Complaining is about a circumstance or a situation that's not wrong. You may have twisted it to make it seem wrong, but it's not wrong, and you're not doing anything to improve it anyways. Criticism is about people expressing disapproval with and dwelling upon the perceived, notice this is very important, the perceived faults of another with no view to their good. We might call this destructive criticism. Now, Technically, there is a form of criticism that is constructive. And everyone who's being critical, they they make it sound like, well, I'm not being, this isn't destructive criticism. I'm trying to help you. I'm telling you you're an an idiot because you need to hear that. Everyone, when they're being critical, they think they're being helpful. But we need to to do some self-assessment when it comes to this attitude and ask ourselves the question, is this spirit coming from God? Is this spirit coming from a heart filled with love? Or is there something else happening? Am I dwelling upon perceived faults? Have any of you ever made an assumption about someone and then later on figured out it was wrong, found out it was wrong? Right? We do this all the time. It is so built into our nature that we don't even realize we're doing it. And we sometimes treat these bad attitudes kind of like skipping breakfast. We know that we should eat breakfast. But we've we don't we know do we know this? Most important of the meal, right? Teachers, don't you know the, under, the difference between having hungry students versus having students that have eaten a breakfast? There's a difference. All of us know that we should eat breakfast, but many of us have gotten away with not eating breakfast and we still think we're okay. And sometimes we treat these bad attitudes the same way. We know we shouldn't be critical. We know we shouldn't complain or be greedy, but we've kind of gotten used to doing it and we think we're okay. So we just continue down that track. Boy, is that a trap. Boy, is that a trap. We need to analyze this. I'm going to share with you something that is, I don't share very often. Maybe I should share it more. This is one of my most treasured possessions. In my very first year of ministry, yeah, in my very first year of ministry, a church member gave this to me. And this is the exact copy. I wish I hadn't written on it. This is the exact copy of the paper that they gave to me. Now, I've moved probably a dozen times since then. I've lost a lot of things. I've managed to not lose this piece of paper because it was so important to me. All it is, all it is is a passage from Manuscript 24, written in 1887 by Ellen White. But it was so profound to me, I have kept it and I have made sure I haven't lost it. And I I treasure it as one of my most beautiful spiritual possessions that someone has ever given me. This is what it says. I don't have it on the screen. I want you just to hear the words here from the minister of the Lord. It does not behoove those from whom Jesus has so much to bear in their failings and perversity to be ever mindful of slights and real or imaginary offense. And yet there are those who are ever suspecting the motives of others about them. They see offense and slights where no such thing is intended. All this is Satan's work in the human heart. The heart filled with that love, remember the antidote to criticism is love, the heart filled with that love which thinks no evil will not be on the watch to notice discourtesies and grievances of which he may be the object. The will of God is that his love shall close the eyes, the ears, and the heart to all such provocations and to all the suggestions with which Satan would fill them. There is a noble majesty 
in the silence of one exposed to evil surmising or outrage. Now, I know it's not easy to listen to long quotes, but I, I'm not going to repeat it. There are some real nuggets in there. I'm going to continue. We must not consider as our enemies all those who do not receive us with a smile on their lips and demonstrations of love. It is much easier to play the martyr than overcome a bad temper. Finally, we must give others an example of not stopping at every trifling offense in order to vindicate our rights. We may expect that false reports will circ circulate about us. But if we follow a straight course, if we remain indifferent to these things, others also will be indifferent. Let us leave to God the care of our reputation. No one can injure our character as much as ourselves. I don't know about you guys, but this speaks to me. And it speaks to me about the culture we live in, where we stop at every offense and we allow a critical spirit to replace the love that God wants to have us. Now, this, this quote is going to come up in the, in the Bible story that we're going to read here in just a minute. So if you have your Bibles, Numbers chapter 12, I'm not putting the verses on the screen. I really want you to see this in your own Bibles if you have them, if you have your Bibles with you. If you're using a digital Bible, that's fine, okay? But I want you to interact with your own scriptures when it comes to this story. And by the way, Rob and Patsy... I'm sorry, but this is a bit of a, re a repeat for you guys, okay? And, and for some of, you, for some of the, the rest of you who are up at uh, family camp. But we're going to spend a little more time in. This is the story. Now, the children of Israel have already dealt with uh, complaining. They've already dealt with the, 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 the challenges of greed. And now chapter 12 opens up the next challenge that they are going to face. Not so much in the community, but amongst the leadership. Just the first three verses. Then... Miriam and Aaron, this is Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. And then you get this little parenthetical statement in verse 3. Now, the man Moses was very humble more than any other man who was on the face of the earth. So here's the story. Miriam and Moses, oh, excuse me, Miriam and Aaron feel threatened. They don't, they, they don't like the fact that 70 new leaders have been established over the community. They believe in the Lord, and we know that God had selected them to be prophets as well, but they feel threatened. Now that Moses has, uh, and the community has developed additional leadership, and so they decide to lash out at Moses. But they don't just lash out at Moses. They lash out at his wife. And not just because of any particular thing, but because of her race. Moses had an interracial marriage. Now, some people believe that Moses was a polygamist, and this is a different woman than Zipporah, I think it's probably more commonly taught and believed within the scholarship that this is Zipporah, and that she was not Cushite by ethnicity, but like we sometimes refer to African Americans, whether they are from Africa or not, you can be a Cuban American and be called African American if you're of, of dark tone. You can be from Brazil, you can be from India or Indonesia, but kind of African American is kind of a, a catch-all term, you know, that's sometimes done that way. She was probably called a Cushite because she was black. Cush was the country south of Egypt where the Nubians were, modern-day Ethiopia. Okay, This is the common, common biblical term for someone who is black. Now, this is similar to what happened in the story of Daniel. Okay, The, the enemies of Daniel are trying to find a problem with Daniel. Do you remember? And it says they couldn't find him doing anything wrong unless they found it in relationship to the law of his God. Remember that? This is kind of what Miriam and Aaron do. They say, we can't find anything wrong with Moses to complain about, so we're going to pick on his wife. This is the leadership. This is the family of, of, of uh, you know, Moses and Aaron and Miriam. 
And right at this critical juncture, right at this moment, as God is trying to bring the community to the promised land, this springs up within the core leadership. Moses, I don't think we can trust you because you've entered into an interracial marriage and that is not acceptable to us. Now, verse 3 is probably an editorial note that Joshua put in later because usually humble people don't say about themselves, I'm the most humble person on earth. But what he's doing is saying, Moses did not respond to this. Remember, Mrs. White said there's a noble majesty in silence. And only we can damage our own reputation. So now, I know what it's like when people are upset with me to have my family attacked. Anyone who's ever been in ministry for any period of time has experienced this to a degree. I know what this is like personally. It is common it is sinful, but it is, it is natural and it happens. And Moses doesn't say a word. They challenge his judgment. We don't think we can follow this guy. Look at the decisions he's made in his marriage. They assert themselves as equal prophets. Criticism is irrational and perverse. Always. It's always irrational and it perverts reality. Up until this point, they had no problem. Let's cross that Red Sea. Yay, Miriam was leading them with the, the dancing and the tambourines. Let's go to, the, to Mount Sinai, receive the law. Everything was fine. Up until they felt their own status had been affected. Now all of a sudden they've got a problem. Now some questions. If these are equal prophets, right? Hasn't the Lord spoken through us as well? Aren't we prophets also? Well, where were they in the previous stories? When Moses himself was crying out to God saying, I have no one to help me with this business. These people are complaining. They're greedy. They're about ready to stone me. Where were Miriam and Aaron in these stories? Nowhere to be found. And what does Zipporah have to do with anything? Why bring her into this? Just out of nowhere, they began to perceive faults and dwell upon these faults that they themselves had created in their mind. How can godly people become so hurtful? Because criticism is irrational and perverse. And we struggle every day with this Christian friend. I know a lot of you are looking at this and say, oh, I know people like that. I had a guy once. I know someone like that. I understand. We see this in others, but we also need to look at it in ourselves. In ourselves. The story continues. Chapter, uh, verse 4. Now, I want you to notice this. These stories just fly by so quickly if you don't just take a breath and pause and look at them. Verse 4, suddenly, suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, you three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. It's like the Lord grabs them all by the ear. I mean, literally, that's kind of what the Hebrew is. It's like, it's like an angry father grabbing his three children and pulling them where he needs to go. But I want you to notice that very first word, suddenly. Moses, in all of his writings, Moses only uses that word twice. He uses other words to talk about urgency and, and immediacy, but he only uses this word twice. Throughout the rest of the uh, Hebrew Bible, the word is used a bit more, and it's always attached to the idea of sudden calamity, sudden invasion, or even sudden violence. The Lord understood that this was not just simply a little minor squabble between some brothers and sisters. He sees this as a calamity. He sees this as a violent moment, a time of invasion. Something has invaded the people of God, and he's going to have to intervene. Suddenly, just on one word. It's good to be a Bible student, isn't it? Don't miss these words. Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, you three come out. So they came out to the tent of meeting. The Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent. He called Aaron and Miriam. It either says he called 
Aaron, Miriam, or it means he called Aaron and Miriam, come here. But either way, when they both had come forward, he said to them, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make himself Make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, openly, not in dark sayings. Behold, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then? Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Very similar to David saying, I will not lift up my hand against the Lord's anointed. When he was tempted to, to kill Saul, right? He had that deference. He had that ability to say, this guy's a bad guy. But God's still in charge. I'm going to let God handle this. The Lord asked Aaron and Miriam the same thing. Why weren't you afraid to speak against my servant? Notice he calls him my servant. Why were then you not afraid to speak against my servant? So notice this. God speaks to the three prophets from the cloud. God reaffirms Moses' leadership. He asks, why were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Why were they not afraid? Because criticism is profane and ungodly. They had forgotten the fear of the Lord. Do you understand that? If they had feared the Lord, they would have thought twice about attacking the servant of the Lord. But because they had forgotten the fear of the Lord, they felt at license to criticize not just Moses, but an innocent party, Zipporah. Criticism is profane and ungodly. All criticism. Sometimes you're thinking, well, that kind of criticism, I get that. I won't do that. All criticism is profane and ungodly. And boy, do we still easily slip into that mode. The Lord comes to Moses' defense. Now notice, it's the Lord who comes to Moses' defense. Moses is silent. Again, that's, that's a hard thing to think about. Uh, married men out there. Someone comes and attacks your family. They criticize your children. They criticize your wife. They say, I don't like what your wife wears. I don't like how her hair looks. I don't like her skin color. Men, would you be silent? That's a hard road of Oh, isn't it? You know, Paul says in the New Testament, vengeance is mine. Let me come to your defense. Those hypotheticals can get you in trouble. I realize they can really get you into trouble. I'm not saying, you know, there's never a response of any kind. But in the wisdom of Moses, he understood the Lord will come to my defense and he will resolve this issue. Why did they not fear to criticize Moses? Because criticism is profane and ungodly. Well, the story continues. Verse 9, so the anger of the Lord burned against them and he departed. But when the cloud had withdrawn from, the, from over the tent, behold, Miriam is now leprous, as white as snow. White as snow. She criticized a black woman. She's white as snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam. Behold, she was leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, I beg you. Oh, all of a sudden, Aaron's awfully, he's now awfully, okay, oh, my Lord, right? Aaron's the older brother, remember? But now all of a sudden, he's saying, Oh, Moses, you're my Lord. Oh, my Lord. This is lowercase l, of course. I beg you, do not account this sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. He, He identifies that he was part of this. Oh, do not like her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. Basically like a still child, a stillborn child. Okay, so Moses cried out to the Lord. Notice who cries out to the Lord on behalf of Miriam. Moses does. On behalf of the woman that just attacked his family, Moses is now praying for her. No wonder Joshua wrote in there, now Moses was the humblest guy you're ever going to meet. Moses cries out to the Lord, God, heal her, I pray. Now, a very interesting thing happens next. I need to take at least a few minutes to explain. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterwards she may be received again. 
So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on again until Miriam was received again. Now, the Lord is speaking here, and he gives a very interesting uh, answer to Moses' prayer, Oh Lord, I beg you, heal her. He makes this statement. The Lord is speaking about in this situation, it's similar to as if the father had spit in the daughter's face. Now, here's a very important Bible tool all of you need to uh, grasp. Before we ask in the Bible what something means, we need to ask what it meant. All right? Before we ask what it means, we have to ask what it meant. Because if you just look at that passage very quickly and superficially from our perspective, spitting in someone's face is not a nice thing. It's a humiliation. It's derogatory. It's meant to insult, right? And even in other contexts, it's it's rare that you can think of a time that spitting in someone's face is a good thing. However, when we look at what the practice that God is describing here, he is specifically referring to the instruction that he had given Moses and the children of Israel that was common in, 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 this, uh, in this culture and time, that it was the res- whenever a family had come under shame, whenever there was a family squabble, this is part of the Leverite custom, part of the Leverite law, if any of you are interested in looking that up, it was the responsibility of the father to remove the shame from the family. And the way he would remove the shame is he would spit upon the one who had introduced the shame, and they would become ceremonially unclean. Now, if that sounds harsh, if that sounds like it is hard to understand why God would ever have a family member spit upon another person, do you know that Jesus spit on people? Do you ever remember reading in the New Testament when Jesus would spit on people? Did he do it because he was mad at them? Oh, you Pharisee, you evil Roman, spit you in your face. When did Jesus spit on people? When he was healing them. When they were blind. When they were deaf. He even spit and touched someone's tongue. The purpose of the spit was to open their eyes. It was to restore them. When Moses, or when God talks about this, he's talking about, yes, shame has come into the family. Yes, this needs to be addressed. The community needs to see the result of that. But the purpose of the spit was not to just humiliate. It was not just to be disgusting. It was because if you bring shame to your family, it's because you're blind and you need to have your eyes opened. Does that make sense? I heard, I heard, did Julian say that? I heard some voice say it. I love it. Isaiah, you and me, man, we are right there at the top. Okay? I just want to make this clear. Sometimes we read these crusty stories in the Old Testament and our minds just go, man, they're spitting on each other and they're doing all this. There is always a redemptive purpose to God's plan. Amen? Okay. The story continues. Miriam is shown as the instigator by bearing the brunt of the punishment. Though though both Aaron and Miriam were involved in this, because the judgment fell more harshly upon her, and she was the older one too, remember? Um, Because she bears the brunt of it, it indicates that she was the primary mover in this story. Aaron confesses, O Lord, I beg you, we have sinned and acted foolishly. So he acknowledges that he was also part of it as well. Moses pleads for his sister as she once pleaded for him. There's just a beautiful... (laughs) Uh, harmony in how these stories unfold. Remember it was Miriam when Moses was a little baby, you know, had to be pushed out into the reeds and uh, parents were trying to save his life. And Miriam was the one that followed the baby. Remember that? And then when this Egyptian princess comes, it was Miriam who said, oh, what a beautiful baby. The gods have provided you with this lovely child. Wouldn't you like to have this child of your own? I can find a wet nurse for you. I know someone who's perfect. Miriam pled for her brother's life. And now it's her brother who pleads for her life. Ah, oh, this is beautiful, guys. You see this? Yeah, yeah. yeah Taylor sees it. Good. <laughs> Moses pleads for his sister as she had once pled. Oh, Lord, don't let her be as one of the dead ones. Heal her. While her disease is removed. Now, the story doesn't say it, but it's indicated that uh, God had removed the leprosy. Uh, we believe that she was restored. Um, while her disease is removed, she still has to go through the custom of impurity. 
and remain outside the camp of seven days before she was able to return. Criticism is sinful and stupid. It just is. We think it's helpful. We think it's going to solve our issues. We think we're going to feel better if we just say, oh, that, this is bad over here. It's sinful and it's stupid. It's never helpful. Notice the Lord's just punishment on Miriam for her criticism. She sought power, right? Are we not one of the prophets? Has the Lord only spoken through Moses? Aren't we just as important as Moses? But she, because of her stupidity, is made powerless. She becomes like the dead one. A person with leprosy, not a lot they can do. Okay? She objected to a black woman. So the, God, so the Lord said, so you really think being white is better? Well, I'll make you white all over all the time. This is not happenstance. These are things there for a reason. She objected to a black woman, so she is made white. She sought to remove an innocent, right? Zipporah, Moses, they were innocent in the story. But she herself finds that she has to be removed from the situation. She criticized Moses, and yet it's Moses who intercedes for her. Which one do you want to be in this story? Do you want to be Miriam? Does that sound like the way to go? Or do you see more of the character of God manifested in Moses in this story? He becomes a source of salvation for his own family. The journey to the promised land is delayed another seven days. And just notice this. The more the church, the more the people of God get caught up in their own issues, the more we allow complaining and greed and criticism to define our identity, to define how we treat each other, it delays God from getting us to the promised land. Do you want the Lord to come? Do you want the Lord to come? Why do you think He's waiting? Because we're still in the desert. We are still dealing with the Egypt that is within us that He is trying to draw out of us. He's given us His law. He's given us His sanctuary. He's given us His Son. But we continue to allow these issues to be uh, uh, so much a part of us. And all of us struggle with this. We see things that don't go the way we want them to go, and the flesh and the brokenness of our nature just wants to lash out. And we want to dwell upon the perceived faults because it's much easier to find faults with others than to reform ourselves. Criticism is sinful and stupid. Lord, personalize it. Is this me? How do you talk about your boss when no one else is around? How do you talk about your parents? How do you talk about your pastor? Go ahead. How do you talk about each other? Am I struggling with this? I think in our moments of transparency and honesty, I think each of us at times still is wrestling with the brokenness in our hearts of trying to find where, where is the path of love in this circumstance? Am I struggling with, do I hurt people with my words, my opinions, and my judgments? Sometimes that's our goal. I want to hurt people. They hurt me. They should suffer as I have suffered. Isn't that fair? Not in the kingdom of God, friends. Not in the kingdom of God. Do I tend to dwell upon the perceived faults? I have a kind of rule that I have um, when I'm dealing with differences with people. First of all, I never resolve differences over email or text. You ever tried to solve an issue with a blog or a comment or an email? How successful is that? The more we get to know people, 
the more we find out the problems we think that we have with them are our own perception. We often judge people without even knowing them. How well did Aaron and Miriam really know Zipporah? Had they really become her friend? I don't think so. I don't think so. We dwell upon perceived faults. How do we know? Well, I heard that they said it about me. Oh, you heard that they said it about you. So it must be true then. Well, yeah. How easily we slip into that. Can I really support my leaders even when I don't agree with them? Amen. Amen. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't identify problems and work together to solve them. How we do that is so important. Am I really willing to follow Christ's example to die to self? That's really what love is, dying to self, putting other people ahead of ourselves. Is that easy? Well, without the Lord, it's impossible. But God is faithful, amen? God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. You don't have to be critical. You don't have to be. You can ask the Lord Jesus Christ to heal you of this, and God is faithful. He can make it happen in your life. He can make you more like Moses to allow the Lord to bring resolution, to allow His love to change the circumstance. The question is, do you want to give in to Christ or do you want to give in to criticism? Which is it? Because you can't have both. You can't have both. It's either Christ on the throne of your hearts or you put yourself and your own perceptions on the throne. God is faithful, amen? He wants to heal us, doesn't he? He wants to empower us. He wants to make us overcomers. He wants his people to be different than the world. All of these things in this quote that I read earlier from Spirit of Prophecy, when I read it, I just hear in this the common realities that dominate our world. And God says, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live that way. I'm with you. I'm with you as a pillar, a foundation, as a savior. I'm with you. You don't have to give in to criticism. You don't have to complain. You don't got to be greedy. No need to doubt. I am with you. And together, 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 we're going to make it to the promised land. We're going to make it there. Want to get there? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know, Lord, it's easy to talk about these things. It's easy to put stories in black and white and put them in front of us and, and, and to, to hear these things. I know that this is not profound or revolutionary to anyone here. We all know how damaging criticism can be. We all know that it's a problem that we need to wrestle with. But Father, in this moment, as we consider who you are in our lives, help us, Lord, every day to come to an altar, to kneel before you and ask for your power to come into our lives, that we would not be depending upon our own strength, we would not be depending upon our own righteousness, but that we would have your vision, our eyes would be healed, so that we would see people as you see them. Flawed, yes. Imperfect, of course. But so are we. We are still trusting in your grace. None of us have arrived. Lord, may your people in this church, in all of our churches, reject criticism and embrace. Embrace the victory that is found in love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next week for the Festival of Praise. Continue the series. 
the week after that. And uh, look forward to being with you. Have a great Sabbath.